Assalamualaikum and good morning. My name is Dr. Siti Halimatun Sahab, ORL Specialist from Hospital Pakar Sutana Fatimah Mua. The topic I'm presenting today is management of rhinosinusitis. My presentation, I got it from the Malaysian CPG Management of Rhinosinusitis in Adolescent and Adults. Uh, in this presentation, I'll give an intro on what is rhinosinusitis, a bit on the epidemiology, how to diagnose, what are the risk factors, physical examination, imaging, uh, lab testing, differential diagnosis, when to refer and how to manage rhinosinusitis. Um, rhinosinusitis, basically it is uh, inflammation of the mucosal lining uh, in the nose and also paranasal sinuses which can be divided into acute and also chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, it is characterized by nasal obstruction, headache, hyposmia or anosmia, post-nasal drip, fever, facial pain and even sore throat and cough. Uh, acute rhinosinusitis, the prevalence ranges about 6 to 15%. As for chronic rhinosinusitis in Asia, it is about 27 to 8%. Smoking is known to be one of the risk factors for rhinosinusitis. Active smokers with a history of allergies has increased susceptibility to acute rhinosinusitis if you compare to those who are non-smokers. For secondhand smokers, uh, carries a higher risk to develop chronic rhinosinusitis um, regardless uh, current or past exposure to secondhand uh, smoke. Other risk factors of uh, chronic rhinosinusitis includes family history, history of ectopic uh, illnesses like asthma, history of allergies, bronchitis, emphysema, uh, nasal polyps, uh, chronic rhinitis, history of allerg uh, acute rhinosinusitis, GERD, sleep apnea, and also adenotonsillitis. We need to get our definitions uh, correct because it will help us in diagnosing and also managing the patient. If a patient has rhinitis symptoms that worsen after five days, we call it acute rhinosinusitis. If it happens within five days, the first five days, it is just common cold or we call it acute viral rhinosinusitis. Common cold usually will resolve completely by day five. But if uh, the symptoms happens after uh, five days and persisted for 10 days and within 12 weeks, they have complete resolution. We call it acute rhinosinusitis. For chronic rhinosinusitis, on the other hand, the symptoms persisted uh, more than 12 weeks uh, without uh, complete resolution of symptoms. In this graph, the one uh, in green, okay, showed you the common cold where it will resolve completely by day 5. If it persisted after day 5 and day 10, we call it acute rhinosinusitis. For ARS, commonly it is caused by viral. Uh, but there are signs of potential acute bacterial rhinosinusitis where patients will have signs like purulent nasal discharge, fever, severe localized pain. If you're able to take blood, there will be elevated ESR and so CRP. And there's also there's a term called double sickening where the, the symptoms become worse again after uh, initial recovery. If your patient have three of these symptoms, you might think of bacteria as the culprit for uh, acute rhinosinusitis and may consider to give them antibiotics. Rhinosinusitis can be diagnosed uh, clinically. The most important thing is the uh, clinical presentation. From the history, you need to ask about symptoms like nasal blockage, nasal discharge, facial pain, and also reduction of smell. Uh, if they have two out of these four, in which one must be either obstruction or discharge, that would be the first uh, criteria. The second criteria whereby they need to have one point of the following. Number one, endoscopic sign. When we do endoscope, there will be presence of mucopus or nasal polyp. 
Number two, if we perform CECT of the paranasal sinuses, there will be mucosal changes in the uh, sinuses or within the osteomyital complex. Or number three, patient will offer you history of medically diagnosed uh, past history of chronic rhinocerositis. If you have fulfilled these two criteria, so you are safe uh, to diagnose uh, a patient to have rhinosinusitis. Physical examination includes anterior rhinoscopy. In primary setting, if you suspect your patient is having acute rhinosinusitis, please perform anterior rhinoscopy. Uh, you will be able uh, to see mucosal edema, inflammation, uh, mucopus, and sometimes even you can find very huge polyps, uh, tumors, or anatomical abnormalities like deviated nasal septum. For CRS, uh, anti rhinoscopy has limited value. Uh, we do perform nasal endoscope to diagnose uh, CRS. There are many ways to perform anterior rhinoscopy. One of it is by using an instrument called tudicum. We insert the instrument inside the nasal cavity with the help of a headlight or torch. Uh, we examine one side at a time to look for mucopus, mucosal changes, tumors, or even uh, abnorm anatomical uh, abnormalities. If your clinic doesn't have um, tudicum, we can use otoscope with the largest uh, diameter earpiece. It acts as a mini scope where you can examine inside the nasal cavity. For nasal endoscopy, uh, it is done routinely as part of the physical examination in ENT clinics. We will examine the nose to look for mucopus, nasal polyps, anatomical abnormalities, or even tumors. So the first recommendation in our Malaysian CPG would be anti rhinoscopy should be performed as part of the physical uh, examination in a suspected case of ARS in primary setting. And nasal endoscope uh, should be performed in uh, ENT centers to diagnose rhinosinusitis. This is how we perform um, nasal endoscope in clinic where we will use rigid nasal endoscope to examine both sides uh, of the nasal cavity. CRS can be divided into CRS without nasal polyp and also CRS with nasal polyp. Uh, in case of uh, CRS without nasal polyp, when we do endoscope, we will see mucopus, mucoporulent discharge coming from the middle meters. Okay. Um, for CRS with nasal polyp, you will see polyps. Polyps looks like a bunch of pill grapes. Like in this picture, it is a grade 3 nasal polyp arising from the middle meters on the right side, extending to the floor of the nose. For imaging, we don't do plain radiograph anymore. The gold standard would be CECT of the paranasal sinuses. It helps to uh, tell us the extent of the disease so that we can prepare patient for basically for surgery. Um, we don't routinely perform CECT in all patients with rhinosinusitis. Uh, comes to the second recommendation of our CPG, uh, plain radiograph is not recommended anymore and CECT should be considered in cases like if patient already uh, had medical therapy but fails, if we plan for surgery and when we think patient is having complication of rhinosinusitis. In acute rhinosinusitis, commonly it is viral. If they fulfill the criteria, then only we diagnose with acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. The commonest bacteria uh, would be strep pneumonia, haemophilus influenza. Moroxella catahelis is commonly in children, not very much in adults. And ropes uh, in cases where uh, the sinusitis is secondary to dental origin. For chronic rhinosinusitis, on the other hand, it is caused by Staph aureus, Enterobacter, and also pseudomonas. So the third recommendation is that uh, culture sensitivity need to be considered in patients who did not respond to the routine or normal uh, antibiotic treatment after 72 hours in acute uh, cases of 
rhinosinusitis. So how do we perform this culture and sensitivity testing? The gold standard would be maxillary sinus tap. However, it is rarely performed and it is invasive. So we prefer endoscopic directed middle miniature culture whereby we will take swab um, endoscopic guided. It is less invasive. So the third recommendation is that endoscopic directed uh, culture should be used um, in diagnosing unresolved bacterial rhinosinusitis by by ENT um, uh, surgeon. And the other recommendation would be nasal swab should not be performed in cases of rhinosinusitis because the normal swab CNS might uh, grow contaminants. Okay. So what are the differential diagnoses of rhinosinusitis? Um, one is uh, allergic rhinitis. The other one is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. The symptoms are all actually almost the same except for the color of the nasal discharge. In rhinosinusitis, the nasal discharge will be purulent, yellowish. As compared to allergic rhinitis and fungal sinusitis, they are clear. They have clear uh, mucinous uh, discharge. Uh, facial pain is more prominent in rhinosinusitis and fever. You will find fever in uh, cases of rhinosinusitis and not in uh, allergic rhinitis or fungal rhinosinusitis. So when to refer patient to ENT uh, clinics, ENT centers? In case of uh, acute rhinosinusitis, um, early referral should be made if they have persistent symptoms despite optimum medical therapy um, or they have more than uh, four uh, recurrences in a year if you suspect malignancy during anterior endoscopy, you found as a mass, or in cases where the patient have immunodeficiencies. Urgent referral should be made if you suspect complications. I will talk about complications later in the slide. Uh, for chronic rhinosinusitis, early referrals actually almost the same uh, when they fail optimal medical therapy, when they have three more than three sinus infection in a year, if you suspect malignancy or fungal uh, infection, or patient who have uh, immunodeficiencies uh, problem. When I say early referral, basically means that the appointment given uh, by ENT should be within two weeks. For urgent referral in chronic rhinosinusitis, again, if you suspect complication, urgent means within 24 hours, uh, ENT should uh, be seeing the patient. Complications of rhinosinusitis can be divided into intraorbital complication, intracranial complication, and also bony complication. Our sinuses is in close proximity to vital structures of the head and neck namely your orbit and also your brain. So any infection of the sinuses can uh, directly go to the eyes and also go to the brain. For the first, the complication would be orbital complication. We use Chandler's uh, classification for this, uh, where there's preceptal cellulitis, orbital cellulitis, orbital abscess, subparastial abscess, and also uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis. So the child is having preceptal cellulitis whereby one uh, of the eye did a swollen. Uh, usually in preceptor cellulitis, the vision is still normal, but they have eye pain and they were able to move uh, the eyeball. Uh, no problem with the extra ocular muscle movement. Um, the other picture in the adult showing that he's having this proptosis and also chemosis. This patient is having cavernous sinus thrombosis. In case of cavernous sinus thrombosis, it is the most severe form whereby the vision, uh, there will be loss of vision and the extraocular muscle movement also will be impaired. When you suspect a patient having complication, intraorbital complication, uh, ENT have to work together with our ophthal uh, colleague to save the eye and also to eliminate the infection inside the nose by draining the infection and also improve ventilation of the uh, uh, nasal, nasal cavity and the sinuses. And if patients have abscesses intra uh, intraorbitally, we have to drain the abscess by means of external or uh, endoscopic. Next complication would be intracranial complication. 
um, because of the close proximity, again, infection in the sinuses can go to the brain. So they can have extradural abscess, uh, subdural abscess, meningitis, encephalitis, and even brain abscess. So if you have a patient with altered consciousness uh, or even fitting meningism that gave history of rhinitis symptoms prior, please think of uh, intracranial complication of rhinosinusitis and this kind of patient might need surgery uh, and warrants of hospitalization and they should be on longer duration of broad spectrum antibiotics. For bony complication, uh, in this picture, the child was having a swelling over the forehead where they ha uh, it looks like a flower horn fish. Yeah? Uh, we call it pot puffy tumor. This pot puffy tumor, uh, when there's uh, infection in the frontal sinus that eats the bone of the frontal sinus, the outer table, whereby infection can protrude uh, through the uh, on the forehead uh, and it looks uh, like a swelling okay uh, in the middle of the forehead uh, the other picture shows mucosal both are bony complication of the uh, rhinosinusitis it can be treated endoscopically and for some severe cases we might need to combine uh, external approach and also endoscopic approach Management of rhinosinusitis can be divided into medical treatment and also uh, surgical treatment. Uh, for medical treatment, there are many medications that can be given, uh, such as antibiotics, corticosteroids, um, nasal douching, antihistamine. Other adjuncts would be analgesia, decongestant, mycolytics, and also antiviral agents. The first drug which uh, can be given uh, is your antibiotics. Um, we prefer amoxicillin and also augmentin. So recommendation number four in our Malaysian CPG, antibiotics uh, should be prescribed in cases where you suspect acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. We give either amoxicillin or augmentin for five to seven uh, days and antibiotics should not be routinely given in chronic rhinosinusitis. For Cases of chronic rhinosinusitis, we can give uh, macrolides, uh, usually administered by uh, ENT specialists, uh, because of its immunomodulator and for its anti-inflammatory properties. Steroids can be given by two ways, either topical, intranasal or oral. Uh, it helps to reduce inflammation and edema inside the mucosal lining, uh, thus uh, improving the patency of the osteomyotal complex. And it also acts as an immunomodulator by stabilizing the muscle, blocking the mediators and inhibits uh, chemotaxis. We can uh, consider giving oral steroids about 25 mg per day for two weeks and it is effective in cases of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyp. So we call it, we call this uh, as medical polypectomy. Okay. And by shrinking the polyp, it might help to improve the hyposmia. There are many, uh, Topical corticosteroid, um, the one that we have in KKM hospital usually will be budisonide, momitason, and so fluticason. So the fifth recommendation in the CPG uh, for intranasal corticosteroid, it should be given about two to three weeks in cases of acute rhinosinusitis. For chronic rhinosinusitis, it should be given for 16 to 52 weeks. Short-term uh, oral steroids should only be given uh, by ENT uh, in ENT uh, clinics okay for nasal douching or saline irrigation uh, it helps to facilitate um, removal of the mucus infective agents and also inflammatory mediators by doing this we might we can help to reduce uh, formation of crusting and also improve mucociliary clearance and uh, recommendation number six uh, irrigation should be used as an adjunct therapy in patients with uh, rhinosinusitis uh, there are many ways to perform nasal douching. Uh, the one that we like would be uh, if the patient will be able to buy bottles. Okay, you can buy these uh, bottles for nasal douching at any leading pharmacies. Uh, if in hospitals, KKM hospital, usually we'll just um, give them syringe uh, to clean the nose. 
the next um, slides will show you uh, the, a video on how to perform uh, nasal touching using this uh, bottle. Um, we need to use filtered or boiled water, which is lukewarm, um, and we dilute the solution inside the bottle. Need to be done. Uh, we lean forward, okay, near the near a sink, uh, and we uh, press the bottle. Uh, so that the water will go inside the nasal cavity. An effective um, douching where if you uh, insert water inside the right nostril, it should go to the opposite side. Okay, you will start seeing all the secretion coming out. When doing this, you should be exhaling to prevent expiration. It is a satisfactory thing to see all the secretion coming out. Okay. okay. Uh, the next drug would be antihistamine. Uh, antihistamine, uh, recommendation number seven, should be given um, when they have associated symptoms suggestive of allergic rhinitis like sneezing, itchiness, runny nose and also nasal obstruction. There are many uh, antihistamines in the in, in market. Uh, the first generation one usually will be the one uh, which is uh, sedative. Uh, the later generation is the less sedative ones. I prefer giving the less sedative ones in the morning sometimes because patients have to go to work, especially if you are a grab driver or forklift driver, you shouldn't give the sedative ones, okay? Adjunct therapy for rhinosinusitis uh, includes analgesia. If the patient complaining of very severe facial pain, please give analgesia. We can give decongestant um, to those who have very bad um, nasal blockage. And this topical decongestant uh, should be given in caution because uh, if they use it more than two weeks, uh, they can cause rebound phenomenon, meaning instead of decongesting, the nose will become more congested. And please uh, be careful in uh, prescribing uh, nasal decongestant in patients with diabetes mellitus, uh, cardiovascular diseases, glaucoma, and also BPH. For mucolytics and antiviral, there are insufficient evidence uh, to help uh, in managing rhinosinusitis. Uh, this is the simplified um, uh, what you call that slide on uh, medication that can be given in patient with rhinosinusitis. Basically, it's the basically it's the same for acute and also chronic. Except for antibiotics, uh, we give antibiotic in cases where we they fulfill the criteria for acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. And uh, for oral steroid, we give to those with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. The rest are basically almost the same. Um, the choices of antibiotics I already explained. We give amoxicillin or omentin. If they have allergy to penicillin, you can give uh, cefiroxim. Um, Clarithromycin usually given in ENT centers um, as a immunomodulator. Uh, choices for intranasal corticosteroid, budesonide, fluticasone, and momitasone. These three, we have it in KKM Hospital. Um, the type of intranasal corticosteroid to be given would depends on the patient's um, findings, nasal endoscope findings. If they have polyps, we prefer to give them momitasone. Uh, next come the surgical part, the surgical treatment. It is only indicated if patient fails optimum medical therapy, regardless in acute or chronic rhinosinusitis, when there is no improvement uh, after 24 to 48 hours, or if patient have complications. The surgery that we do will be a minimally invasive surgery called FES, Functional Endoscopic Sinus Surgery. The aim is to remove the disease mucosa and to improve and enlarge the drainage to improve the ventilation. By doing this, uh, we can help to improve the nasal obstruction and also reduce the polyp size and improve the symptoms of post nasal drip and also headache. Recommendation number eight would be surgery considered in acute rhinosinusitis with complication. For chronic rhinosinusitis, surgery will be indicated or offered in patients who fail optimum medical therapy. Uh, management for acute rhinosinusitis for primary care and non-ENT centers. 
um, if the patient have symptoms of common colds, we just treat accordingly. Basically, symptomatic treatment because it may resolve, it will resolve by day five. But if they have a mild acute rhinus sinusitis, when they have vast score of less than three, we can give symptomatic relief medication like analgesia, um, decongestant, you can give nasal irrigation. Um, if there is no improvement after 10 days, we can consider topical steroids. If again, no improvement after two weeks, refer to ENT. If the patient have moderate um, or severe ERS, uh, we give symptomatic relief first and also topical steroids. If no improvement after three days uh, or 72 hours, please uh, refer to ENT. Management of uh, CRS uh, for primary care and non-ENT centers, we give topical steroids and also nasal irrigation. And please reevaluate after four weeks. If there's improvement, just continue the medication. If no improvement, refer to the nearest ENT clinic. So what we do in ENT clinic when we, research, when we receive a referral from the primary uh, care or non-ENT centers, we still go back to the history and then we do endoscope as part of the physical examination. For moderate uh, ERS, we will do endoscope and then we will take culture and sensitivity. We give, uh, again, symptomatic relief and we give oral antibiotics and topical uh, corticosteroids. In cases of severe ERS, sometimes they might warrant uh, hospitalization. Uh, when they are hospitalized, we will perform CT scan of the paranasal sinuses and may consider surgery if medical therapy fails uh, after 48 hours. For ARS with complication, it is one of ENT emergency definitely need to be admitted. We have to perform CT scan of the paranasal sinus and prepare patient for surgery. Uh, for cases of uh, CRS in our center or in any of uh, ENT centers, um, history and nasal endoscope need to be done and we will start treatment like topical steroids, irrigation, short-term oral corticosteroid uh, and also uh, macrolides okay, as immunomodulator. If there's improvement, we just continue with the current medication. If no improvement, we will perform CT scan uh, and consider functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, I think this would be my last slide. So in conclusion, uh, rhinosinusitis is a clinical diagnosis. Everyone should be able to diagnose uh, CRS or ARS and you can give you can follow the Malaysian CPG. You can download, download the CPG from the MOH website. Uh, we can give um, treatment first. If no improvement, please refer to ENT. Uh, and the most important thing is to prevent them from uh, having complications. And it is important also for you guys to detect complications so that it they can be referred earlier to centers with uh, ENT uh, so that we can save the eye and even save the patient's life if patients have intracranial complications. With that, I thank you.